and welcome back to You Regina 120. I am Jeff Click, and this is a series of 120 videos of things that I've learned at the University of Regina that I think that you should know. And today is the second attempt at doing the burden of proof logical fallacy uh, video. The first attempt went way too long, so we're going to try to shorten this up here. So hopefully we get everything in the small amount of time we have to do it. So. Uh, first of all, uh, before we even discuss what the burden of proof uh, logical fallacy is, uh, is we're going to have to discuss what exactly is a claim. And when we talk about a claim in this video, what are we talking about? What are we meaning? And so when uh, there is someone who says that something is a fact uh, or a proven fact, or they specifically separate out opinion and fact and claim that something that they are saying is a fact rather than a, an opinion, that is a claim. That is a very clear instance of a claim. It is something that they are claiming. It is a thing that they are trying to get across to you, to for you to believe. Now, opinions may also be claims. Uh, however, when we talk about claims, uh, we want to try to prefer to talk about the clear instances of those. And in that case, uh, that is a clear instance of a claim that you can easily wrap your, your mind around. You know, you probably come across lots of people who just say, you know, believe me because I say so, uh, or because here's my evidence for it, or whatever it is. Uh, but this is what we're talking about here. Something where people are trying to tell you to believe something. And we have a finite amount of energy, a finite amount of uh, memory uh, to spend verifying claims. So we have a finite mind share. Uh, we have, uh, you know, a finite amount of emotional stability, stress, money, blood, sweat, tears, uh, anything that has a cost, we only have so much. And we, we, we can think of ourselves as these sort of infinite beings with all these infinite resources, but in the fact it is not true, there's a claim right there, uh, you are going to eventually leave this planet, you're not going to live forever, uh, and no matter who you are, you have some kind of restrictions on what you can do, what you can spend your energy uh, verifying. And so there's going to be a n more claims than you can deal with. Uh, there's a, an uncountably infinite number of claims that you could verify, and you have a finite amount of resources to allocate among them. And so now, I mean, we have the right to a belief. We have the right to believe some claims more than others. In Canada, we have this right in part due to Section 2 of our Charter of Rights and Freedoms. But how do we use it? What, what is the best way of allocating our, our belief among these uncountably infinite number of possible beliefs or possible things we could believe, uh, and what are ways we could approach this problem? And so a, or a burden of proof or a distribution of burden of proof among them uh, is what we would consider to be a theory of defaults, a way of allocating your finite potential for belief among the correct possibilities or predictions that could be uh, of things you could believe, especially in the context where you're in a discussion or an argument with someone else. Uh, and the question is, how do we, what is the best way to make this default work? Uh, what is the way for us to, to, to make it, it so that by default, we tend to believe the right things more than the wrong things? That we tend to believe the truth rather than things that are false. Um, and so what are ways we could kind of take steps towards a theory of default that would work in this case? Uh, the first step is to kind of order claims by how extraordinary they are. So uh, if you have a claim that would take a lot of uh, kind of disbelief to believe, a claim that is would require you to believe many other things, a claim that would uh, cause you to predict vastly different things than you currently are, are predicting, that would be an extraordinary claim. Uh, and extraordinary claims uh, needs to be backed by extraordinary amounts of evidence. If you are going to believe something uh, that is vastly different than what you currently believe, you're probably going to need a vast amount of reasons to do so. Uh, this is kind of a hopefully natural thing. Um, when kind of spoken in such clear language, uh, or hopefully clear, uh, it, it is a persuasive thing to kind of uh, look at claims that are in front of you and uh, kind of gauge them by. Uh, but when we say this, the point here is that 
it relieves us of effort to have to think about claims that are not backed by evidence, uh, amounting to the amount of extraordinariness uh, of the claim itself. So if, you, uh, if someone says something and it's so far out there that you just have to strain yourself to even consider it, uh, if they don't back it by reasons to believe it, you don't have to strain yourself. You just can let them kind of pass on by, say, okay, well, you know, if you believe that, whatever, but I'm not going to believe you. I do not believe you. Uh, that is okay, and you can save yourself a lot of effort, which can be directed at many other possible claims. Again, there are uncountably infinite number of claims that you could direct energy to, that you could listen to, that you could pay attention to, and if one of them is uh, in front of you that doesn't have enough evidence to justify uh, it's taking up space in your life or your mind or your computer, then let it pass. Don't, don't necessarily accept it. And so the, the part of the, the question here is also uh, who is believing the default here? What is the theory of default in relation to? I, is it you as an individual? Is it you as an individual at some position uh, of society? Is it you as an individual as part of a group? Uh, or is it you as an individual as part of a legal system or a country? Uh, these are important questions that will determine uh, the ways in which the default uh, is going to end up working. So for example, uh, one thing we would not want to happen is for you to have an extremely high burden of proof or a high level of certainty uh, that you would require to believe anything in a private conversation with a friend that you really trust. So for example, the following conversation uh, you would not want to have. So it would go something like this, where you would come up to your friend and you'd say, oh, hey, how's it going? And your friend would say, oh, not bad. And then you would respond, well, what are you up to? And your friend would say, you know, oh, just chilling and listening to Eden the cat. And you would respond to that saying, prove it. And of course, your friend would be very confused. And you would again say, prove that you're listening to Eden the cat. And your friend would again be very confused and say, uh, well, I have last FM. Here's what I've been listening to today. Uh, and then you would say, well, I do, I do not accept your proof. Uh, well, again, it's unless you're just being funny or something, uh, that is taking it way too far. Uh, in a private conversation with someone that you trust, uh, there may not be a reason for you to disbelieve a simple thing that they are going to say. Again, the claim I am listening to even the cat is not all that extraordinary. I mean, not everyone in the world listens to her, but again, we finding music on the internet to listen to is something that many people do. Uh, certainly many people in my uh, social circle do. Uh, and listening to one artist rather than another is not going to be uh, that much of a shock to me. So there shouldn't be a high level of evidence that I expect from them in order to believe that they're in fact listening to Eden the Cat rather than say Britney Spears. Now, I might even look down on them a little bit for listening to Britney Spears, but again, Britney Spears, a lot of people enjoy her music, it's kind of got a good beat sometimes, so it's not that shocking to imagine that someone might be listening to even her or something like that. So we, we should believe some people uh, with a lower level of uh, evidence backing their claims, and other people with a higher level of evidence in those, with those claims. And we have to be careful of where we set those two levels so that we end up learning the most that we can learn in an acceptable way to both ourselves and the world around us. And so there's going to be things like, uh, what are the costs of getting the belief wrong? Uh, in the case of believing that my friend is listening to even the cat, that's not a really terrible thing for me to get wrong. I, I'm, I, I can't imagine what that would cost me. Whereas if I were a scientific journal uh, and I published something that was pure bogus, uh, that would be a significant hit to my reputation and as a journal of science, uh, and society would suffer as a result because they would not be able to trust the other things that I would say uh, that they then build the rest of their society with. And so uh, it's, it's important for institutions like the legal system uh, and scientific, scientific journals to get things right in a way that isn't necessarily true in private conversations about trivial matters such as who's listening to what uh, at any particular time uh, that it makes these two situations different. Of course, in the case of scientific journals, there's also another problem that comes with this, which is that uh, if you set the uh, level of evidence uh, too low uh, for findings, you end up with 
uh, something called the file drawer problem, where uh, someone will conduct an experiment a certain number of times, and just by pure chance alone, they'll get a result, and they'll publish that result that's, again, just due to pure chance, and they do not publish the uh, other hundred times they've tried the experiment and it didn't work. Uh, that's something that we can discuss uh, ways around in other videos, but hopefully the, the, the level of certainty that they have gotten that result is set high enough that that particular problem doesn't happen as much. It does, but again, it's something we're thinking about. So there's basically a trade-off that our th theory of default is going to have to make between about four different kinds of things. Uh, first of all, who we are and who made the claim, uh, and who made the claim originally. So if you're in a discussion about religion and evolution or something, and you are just some guy, and the person you're discussing with is just some guy, uh, and you're both talking as if you are, you, you have the direct evidence from the leading scientific experts of the day, uh, then you probably want to gauge who is believed and who is not believed in terms of kind of what the experts are, are doing, to some extent at least. You shouldn't necessarily take everything that they're saying just you know, purely uh, and believe it, uh, but again, it, it's, it's going to depend upon who's involved. Um, it's, as mentioned, going to depend upon how strong the claim is and how extraordinary the claim is and who uh, is making the, the, the least likely claim, the most complex claim, uh, and the, the, the claim that kind of strains credulity the most. Uh, and it's going to depend on the environment that the claim is taking part in, which we're going to talk about in a little bit here. Uh, and it's also going to uh, involve uh, the, the, the kind of right to, uh, or access to data. So for example, if uh, I have a lab that can test something, uh, and you, know, you accept that I have a lab that can test something, that is going to kind of uh, sway the theory of default as far as whether or not when I say that I've got something out of my lab, that you should or should not believe me. But the, of course, most important is who's making the claim. And so the, the reason that that is kind of important is uh, the, uh, when you are in a discussion, the person who is making the claim is the person who has, or it is more uh, conducive to truth being passed on when the person who is making the claim has to justify it, not the other way around. And we'll get into that a little bit more as we go too. Uh, and so, uh, just kind of as an example of this, you can think of this in a similar way uh, to what happens when you have a little bit of money in your pocket, uh, you know, you've, you've worked at a job, uh, or you, you've gotten some allowance, or whatever it is you've gotten this money from, and then people start asking you to spend it on their particular thing. So you go to university, the, the bookstore will tell you, you know, you want to give us your money so we can give you textbooks. Uh, and they're going to be very persuasive, some of them. Uh, but you have to keep in mind, at any given point, uh, no matter if you're a student at university, if you are a person who's renting from a landlord, no matter what your situation is, you do not have to give up that money. Uh, it's, if you're using something like Bitcoin, uh, you definitely don't have to give up that money because nobody can even really force you uh, without you know, going to the extent of torture, I guess. Uh, but the, the point here is that uh, you are going to have to choose whether or not you, for example, want to uh, succeed in university. Uh, and if you do want to succeed in university, if you want to do so by getting a textbook that the bookstore gives you, you have to be the one that makes the choice. The bookstore cannot make that choice for you. Don't let the bookstore make that choice for you. Uh, make sure that whatever it is you're doing with your money aligns with what you want and your values, etc. And so the Part of the reason that you want to do this uh, is because uh, you want to, or because human senses are imperfect, our institutions are imperfect, the university bookstore is imperfect, uh, the books that they sell are good, uh, but they're not perfect. Uh, our memory is imperfect, uh, people gaslight each other, uh, there's, uh, as mentioned in the last video, there's a part of your brain that makes up narratives to justify your past behavior, your past perceptions, so no matter how wrong you were in the past, uh, you'll probably see yourself, uh, unless you're kind of trained otherwise, as doing the right thing. Um, and sometimes we're wrong, and it, it, it may seem obvious to other people, and this is, again, another important point, uh, that one of the things we want to do with this theory of default is make it so that other people can help us uh, believe the true things and challenge our beliefs 
such that we can use the, the work and the thoughts of the other seven billion people in the world uh, to get to the correct default belief. Uh, so we don't want to completely ignore everyone else in the world. That would be going too far as well. But so again, the uh, the the university bookstore isn't imperfect. The person that you're arguing with isn't perfect. If they're trying to convince you of something, if you're in a discussion and they have a belief that they want you to believe, they are imperfect beings. They are th they are not necessarily uh, correct. And if you always accept what they tell you, uh, you are going to be misled. You're going to be misled. You're going to be taken advantage of and bad things are going to happen to you because other people aren't necessarily going to be correct all the time. And so the burden of proof uh, should always lie and fall on the claimant, and on the person making the claim, not the skeptic. And so if you want to seek to convince a skeptic, uh, you are going to have to do so based on ideally evidence and valid arguments. Uh, and this is where I'm going to kind of depart a little bit from some of the other uh, videos you'll see on the internet. But uh, if you are, you know, a claimant and making a claim, uh, I think that other things can be brought into play, such as uh, other kinds of appeals um, and understanding the skeptic's point of view. That's an important one. And actually going out and reaching out and saying, you know, I want to understand how you view things. That's an important part that could be used to help the skeptic understand your point of view. But also other appeals too. Uh, so, uh, you know, you can bribe the skeptic, you can, uh, you know, get close to them and, you know, make them feel fuzzy and warm and stuff like that. Uh, all sorts of appeals can be made. The important part here is that the skeptic has no obligation to believe you. And they definitely don't have an obligation to prove your claim false. They merely have to believe it if they choose to do so until it is or at the point where it's appropriate to do so and not a second further. Uh, and this is also true when you're dealing with probabilities. So if your claim is that uh, something is 1% or you know, plausible or 1% uh, true or whatever, uh, they do not have to change their probability distributions. They don't have to believe that you have the correct probability or anything like that. The important thing is that you, as the person who is making the claim, has the responsibility of the burden of proof, not the person who is going to be believing you or not believing you. And uh, again, kind of disagreeing with some of the other videos on the internet here, sometimes it's not absolutely clear who is making the claim and who isn't. Uh, and the, there's a kind of back and forth where some people will say, well, if you know my claim isn't true, then what accounts for this? Well, you don't, again, you don't have to justify uh, and you don't have to explain all the data that the claimant has. Uh, you can say that you don't even have an ex a hypothesis or a guess of what explains the data. Your default answer in this situation should be, I don't know. Let's say that again, because it is very important. What do you do when you don't know why, or, or you can't account for some evidence, and your a, a claimant that is trying to tell you to believe something uh, but you just can't accept it yet because you don't feel that they have enough evidence for their explanation of some data. Your response should be, I don't know. And not knowing is not a bad thing. Obviously, it would be better if you had an explanation, or better if there was something that you could explain the data from. But uh, it's much more important for you to not be misled uh, than that particular uh, thing. And we can always eliminate bad answers, even if we don't know the good answers. Uh, we can change the distribution of probability that we have. Uh, and even if you don't know any enough about statistics to do that, that's okay. The important thing is that if you don't know something, and if you're not sure about something, it's okay to just say, I don't know. The C2 wiki, which is a good website in general, uh, points out that some environments are just too toxic and unstable for a proper burden of proof to be set up. Uh, some things that help are, one, if each participant respects the other enough to be willing to actually help them change their mind. That's, that tends to help. Two, uh, if each participant is not uh, or is not suspected to be a government spy or a marketer because Sometimes if you're in an environment where uh, you know that the government is trying to disrupt you, uh, or you know that you know, some corporate uh, institution may be trying to mislead you, uh, it gets difficult to be an honest skeptic 
because there is no amount of evidence that you'll be able to believe, and so that's problematic. Uh, they uh, refer uh, to something called the Grissian, if I'm pronouncing that right, cooperation principle. Uh, that apparently helps. Uh, the use of uh, logical uh, arguments in which you have two sides, and those two sides are opposed, and it's made very clear that you have two sides and that those two sides are opposed, uh, and that both sides can be heard and fairly judged, both by each other and by third parties, uh, and the right of both sides to put forward the best case that they need uh, is respected. Uh, all of these things help when you have a set of claims to discuss so that you can have the best evidence put forward, so that you can believe the best evidence that is, is available. Uh, if any of these things is not available, then you start having problems because suddenly you can imagine that there may, for example, be some evidence that they are not allowed to bring up or that is, for whatever reason, not permitted to be discussed uh, on the particular forum that you're discussing it. Uh, other things that may make this go wrong is if there are strong social forces that drive the argument uh, that are not necessarily related to, say, the truth. So, for example, right now, uh, in Europe, there's a lot of discussion about uh, uh, refugees and migrants traveling from border to border. Uh, in some of those discussions, there's a real um, push being made uh, by powerful so social entities uh, one way or another, and that is not conducive to uh, a skeptic being able to make a reasonable decision one way or the other. If the accused uh, or the people involved, either I guess the accuser or the accused, uh, can be stigmatized for merely participating in the discussion, uh, that makes discussion very difficult, and it makes it difficult for skeptics to do their job, i.e. Uh, to believe the right things when it is time for them to believe it. If there's a climate of fear, if everyone involved is afraid for their lives even, uh, then again, w as we discussed in the argument from uh, emotion, uh, there's going to be a kind of shortcut in the thinking that we do, uh, and that shortcut is not always going to lead us to the truth. Uh, if we're talking about a legal system, uh, and the burden of who, who the burden of proof lies on in a legal system, uh, the trial has to look fair. Uh, it has to seem fair to the participants and to the third parties. Uh, if, for example, uh, it seems as though perhaps um, there's something, you know, grossly wrong about the trial, uh, then perhaps we have to raise our level of skepticism uh, beyond what it is possible to prove in the trial itself. Uh, they suggest the use of simulated evidence as opposed to real evidence. Uh, the n if the evidence is not falsifiable, that's also something that will uh, cause problems. Uh, if the expert testimony is not direct, if it's also simulated, that's also a problem. Uh, if the burden of proof starts to look as though it's being shifted from the claimant to the person who is having to defend themselves uh, against the claim, that can cause problems. Non-openness. So if the trial is held behind closed doors, as, it, as is the case in some terrorism trials in Canada, uh, then it is possible for bad things to happen behind closed doors that we may be better not to believe the results of. Same thing with the FISA courts in the States. Uh, and then finally, if one side or the other is using and allowed to use loaded questions, uh, questions such as, are you beating, or when did you stop beating your wife? Questions like the ones we saw in the Euthydemus video, uh, where you're, you can't really answer the question and again, we'll talk about how you answer those questions maybe in a later video, but uh, the pr they're problematic in and of themselves. And so what do you do when you're faced with a situation like this where uh, the, the person you're, you're discussing with is biased uh, or you're in a toxic situation? Uh, and of course the answer is you, you should not necessarily believe them. Uh, we can be consciously aware that there is a problem. That's a good step. Uh, we can allocate resources to address the, the, the kind of root cause of the problem. So if, for example, we don't have enough effort to, you know, allocate to deciding a claim, we can allocate more effort to it. Um, but there's only so much we can do, uh, and so there's only so much carefulness that we can, we can allocate uh, to this particular kind of problem. And this means being willing to let some people live ignorant. Uh, and 
I mean, this video series is free. Uh, you have an entire internet available to, to educate yourself, but not everyone has the time, not everyone has the em emotional energy, not everyone has the focus to sit through these 120 videos. So some people are just not going to know some of the things that they could be knowing. And when you discuss things with them, you should have the expectation that there may be some people that you just cannot reach. You don't have to be happy about that, but you just have to know that it's possible. Uh, and uh, again, it's important that if the environment doesn't allow for the skeptic to come up to a belief or a level of belief that the claimant is making, uh, then the skeptic should make no commitment to believing what the claimant wants them to believe. Uh, and the reason we have structured debates, public debates, uh, public discussions, or even private discussions where matters like this are discussed, uh, and we, we do have structured debates as we have the, uh, in the past couple of months, the leaders debate in, the, uh, in Canada between the political party leaders. Uh, we, we could have, uh, it could have been better, but it, when, when we set these things up, uh, instead of just having a yelling match, uh, we, we, we want to have the best evidence for arguments and for various positions brought forward. Uh, the, the closer we have to this kind of ideal, the better. Uh, in the case of the leaders' debates, they haven't been very good this year. Um, but the, again, the reason we have them is so that we, we, can, we can make the decision of where to put our belief, uh, or at least where to allocate possible belief, uh, and we want to uh, look at the, the ways that things can go wrong and remove as many of them as possible from that particular discussion uh, or that particular kind of discussion whenever it comes up. So what are some things that, as other videos in this series, uh, the burden of proof is related to, uh, in, given the other things we've talked about so far? Uh, so the first thing it's kind of related to is the proverbs video. Uh, because proposing a hypothesis is okay, or proposing a guess is okay, uh, but if everyone proposed them and believed them without, tru w without proof, we'd have too many to use, and we'd have contradictory uh, guesses and hypotheses, and the trick is that we have to have some economy uh, upon which hypotheses to believe. We have to decide which proverbs to believe rather than others, and we have to justify that and have those justified to us. It's related to the argument from ignorance, because if we accept something that, without sufficient evidence, uh, and then start to argue from it, we are by default arguing from ignorance. We are making claims based on not our, or based on not knowing things, but on our not knowing things. That, so when you fail to use a good enough burden of proof, you risk arguing from ignorance. It's related to the to Kokoi video, again if I'm pronouncing that right, uh, and that it is also a similar kind of shifting of the burden of who says and who believes what. Uh, in that case, it's the uh, shift in behavior and action and the perception of behavior and action. And from the right of kind of who has the right to claim what. It's related to Occam's razor. Uh, Occam's razor is related in that uh, it will tell you what to do with your hypo or hypotheses and your guesses after they have met the burden of proof. So you, you apply your burden of proof, you, you take the uncountably infinite number of possible guesses that could be explaining your situation or, or suggesting action or whatever, and then you start using Occam's razor maybe, and other things, to pick the best one. Uh, but you get to the point where you can have a ability to pick uh, with, with the burden of proof to start with. It's related to the optimization problem video, because this is actually, in fact, an optimization problem. I'm not going to go through the, the, the actual optimizing of it, but if you want to approach it that way, you can. And, uh, as kind of mentioned, uh, there are other uh, videos on the internet about this topic. Uh, one of the best ones is probably the one from Qualia Soup. Um, and I'm going to disagree with him on two points, uh, or two or three points. One is that, uh, in their perspective, uh, it's never unclear who is making the claim uh, and who is not. Uh, I have personally found, by my experience, that sometimes it is unclear. And sometimes you have multiple people making a claim in such a way that it's, it's, it gets confused and there is, a, in fact, a scramble for the high ground of who has to do the proving. 
And the way around this particular kind of problem, and the way that you may not see it as a problem as much anymore, is because the internet actually provides us a way of dealing with it, which is threaded discussion systems. Systems such as Reddit and Slashdot, where you can actually establish a, establish a deterministic order in which you can see who makes what claim and then who has to justify it. Um, if you have the highest person in the thread saying something, they have to justify lower down the thread as they go. And, uh, you know, go, don't agree to the terms of service, but go see if you can use Reddit uh, and dis discuss things if you find that that particular problem comes up. I'm also going to disagree with Paul Soup, uh, where he says that poetry and supernatural explanations get us no closer to understanding at least at the, this level of discussion, uh, matters of the universe. Uh, and I personally think that if you're having a discussion with someone who accepts supernatural beliefs, or the existence of God, or divine answers for questions, that they should be given respect enough to try to make a case for them. However, likewise, on the flip side, their claims are not privileged. Their claims are extraordinary, in some cases extremely extraordinary, and so they have to make a case for them in the order of magnitude that it is extraordinary in order for you, the skeptic, to believe them. So for believers and theists, I would expect for them to appreciate their God's creation enough in, in a detailed enough level to be able to convince the skeptics of their claims. And on the flip side, for non-believers and for atheists, uh, that they should desire and succeed in understanding the process, or in understanding the processes that govern the material world, and that there is a kind of uh, symmetry between the two cases, where they there is a responsibility if they're going to make a claim that they should actually go and make the claim and back it up with evidence. Quali uh, Soup also makes the point that there's a bunch of standard arguments for the existence of the divine, and that these show good examples of flawed reasoning. I agree with that. I think there are, uh, and the list that they brought up is a good list. Uh, however, they would only have ever come out if we had gotten to the point where those who believe in the supernatural actually made an effort to explain their thought process behind their belief and to come out and to state them. And so that is actually a benefit to us because it helps us think. It helps us see where they are seeing the beliefs that they believe. Uh, and in fact, it definitely beats them using a baculum, going back to the argument from baculum, uh, which is how theists have historically resolved uh, criticism of their ideas. Also, it's worth pointing out, out that if you're a skeptic, or if you're a student who's in the university bookstore, that you should accept some level of possible proof, that you should, even for extremely uh, extraordinary claims, you should accept some level of evidence for them. Uh, otherwise, you're not in a discussion. Otherwise, you're not really a possible student. You know, you should be somewhere else doing something else, discussing something with someone else. The, there is some exceptions to the burden of proof that might be worth thinking about. The first is the uh, burden of proof for the burden of proof itself. Uh, this is something that you may, uh, for reasons of self-consistency in your logical system of belief, uh, want to give a free pass to. So believe this video. Uh, in addition, there are some questions where the stakes are extremely high. So for example, if you have a firearm, you should treat that firearm as loaded. And if you point that firearm at someone, you should only do so if you intend to hurt and or kill them even if the firearm is probably empty and it's probably safe to do so. It is just good practice to do so. And so some situations are going to be like that, where you have the expectation is better if you just believe, for safety reasons, uh, something that is unlikely. But be careful when you do so. There, there may be a reason to believe uh, or to uh, have a lower burden of proof uh, if there's a justifiable paternal uh, or paternalistic relationship involved. If you're a teacher and you have students, while it's a good idea in general to force your students to be as skeptical as possible, sometimes it's also worth getting them to actually go out and do the work themselves and to make claims themselves that they have to go out and do work to defend. 
And usually the kids don't end up seeing a difference between making positive claims or not, so you don't have to work very hard to do this. In, as another example, or, uh, there are some examples of this. Uh, the, the best kind of example is the burden of proof in a uh, law, and in, especially in criminal law, uh, is the, the burden of proof is on the prosecution side, where they have to uh, prove to the jury or the judge or whoever uh, that the, the defendant, the person that they're accusing, is guilty, and they have to do so at a high level or a high standard of belief, a, a belief called the reasonable doubt level of belief, where it's extremely high uh, amount of evidence is required to do so. In civil cases, during civil cases, you have a lower level of uh, burden of proof, uh, a 50% plus one uh, level, because in civil cases, it's a lot closer to two sets of claims being made rather than one set of claims being made by a powerful entity against an entity who is not necessarily as powerful. Uh, in the U.S. Uh, specifically, there, there's also something called the burden of production, which is basically the burden of proof that you need to meet in order to even get a trial or in order to even get your claims heard in front of a court, whereas there's something called the burden of persuasion, which is the level of burden of proof or the level of evidence that you need in order to convince the judge or to convince the person that in the court that your claims are true. So it's kind of split up into in, a two-part process. And you can see a similar uh, splitting up in other areas, although there may not be a name for that process. It's also worth pointing out that some people have been getting away with not explaining their ideas for a long, long time. And they've grown very accustomed to doing so. And the answer to this situation is not to allow them to continue to get away with it, but to put an end to this by questioning their belief. As Jello Biafra says, question everything. It's also worth pointing out that sometimes it puts us in an impossible situation where the data is only accessible to one person, where only one person can witness certain things at a time. Uh, and this is a problem, uh, but again, it is just something to keep in mind. And there are going to be some unfalsifiable, uh, unfalsifiable claims, and claims that you can't prove happen one way or another, and so there's no real way to judge how extraordinary they are. And so, for example, the Large Hadron Collider, uh, when it was finally put together, was able to test the existence of the uh, Higgs boson. Uh, up until that point, this was not a testable thing. You would have to build this machine and then test it. In theory, it was, of course, testable, but in practice, it wasn't. And so there was some level of belief that you would have to hold in this existence of this particle that was purely founded on faith that could not be justified uh, until 2011 to 2013 when we built the stuff to do it. It's also worth pointing out that the theory of default is going to, to some extent, support the status quo. And the status quo is not necessarily uh, the best thing that could be, the best universe we could be living in. And so it's worth thinking about, uh, at least in some cases, uh, believing for the purposes of allowing a better status quo. Although, you, again, you have to be very careful of how you do that, but just being aware that there are uh, ways that things could be better is an important first step. Uh, in closing, some of the people watching this video are probably going to be confused in this video and other videos because, you know, I'm a computer science student. What does this have to do with computers? You know, we have all these videos about logic and, and arguments and discussions. Where does, when do we get into the programming part? When do we get to build computers and play with computers? And it's worth pointing out in this particular case that there's something called the Curry-Howard correspondence, which says that for every proof, there is a computer program and vice versa. I'm not going to go into the kind of details of this argument, but it's worth pointing out that when you start talking about a theory of defaults, a theory for how proof has to work, that you are now in the realm of what programs do, and that you, whenever you have a proof that you're talking about, you are also, in fact, talking about a possible computer program. It's hard to see it. It's hard to wrap your mind around the fact that you are, in fact, talking about something that can be expressed in programming uh, language. Uh, but that is in fact what we were doing. And finally, censorship is an important matter in this particular concept, her context. 
because it shifts the burden of proof. We should allow the censored ideas an easier burden to meet if they are to have any hope at all of convincing us. Uh, otherwise, we would grant the ability to, deter to determine what is in our minds, what efforts we have to grant to ideas, and what we believe, not in terms of how much truth these ideas and these claims and these beliefs carry, or how much they could convince us if we were on even and level ground, but to who has the bigger stick and who is most eager to use it. We should not do that. We should aim to believe the truth and to not allow those with big sticks to convince us to believe things purely because they have a big stick. So, as usual, uh, if you have any questions about the burden of proof or a theory of people, uh, feel free to ask them anywhere where this video is posted. Uh, and uh, as usual, uh, we can always use some funds for whiteboard markers, so please donate to the Bitcoin address uh, listed anywhere where this video is posted. And uh, we will see you in the next video.